All right, Hebrews chapter 8. We are making our way through the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> Hebrews. The theme of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. Christ is better. He is better. He is better. He's best. Remember the purpose of the book? It's a book of encouragement. It's, a, it's to encourage persecuted Jews, Christian Jews, not to give up, not to turn back from their faith. They're, they're tempted to, to go back to the old system under the law, under Judaism. So the writer's making the case, why do you want to go back to an inferior system when Jesus is so much greater? And, and I just keep doing these reviews so that way you can have the general idea of the book. Uh, he's, ma he's making the case for Christ's superiority. Chapter 1 is a superior revelation. <coughs> Chapter 2, he's superior than the angels. Chapter 3, he's superior than Moses, the giver of the law. Chapter 5, he's superior than Aaron and the priesthood. And remember, there's five warnings interjected throughout Hebrews. The first warning chapter is in chapter 2, the danger of drifting. The second warning in chapter 3 and 4 is the danger of missing rest. The third warning in chapter 6 is the danger of immaturity. And we'll come back, we'll see more of those, two more of those warnings as we progress through the book. But today is chapter 8, and in chapter 8, he's continuing on the theme of... Um, the previous chapter, he's staying on that theme of Jesus is a superior priest. It's a greater priesthood. Uh, it's a greater, the new system is a greater system than the old sacrificial system. And uh, that's basically the rest of the letter. He, we're really going to get into Old Testament uh, Judaism and the priesthood a little bit more. And uh, But anyways, chapter 8. Chapter 8 could be broken down in three different sections. I like to outline. Outline points help, help me to remember. And so this chapter deals with a superior high priest, verse 1. A superior place. Superior priest. Superior place. Verses 2 through 5. And superior promises. Verses 6 through 13. This is a, another pivotal chapter. Superior priest, superior place, superior promises. <coughs> All right, so we'll start at verse 1. Superior high priest. He says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. In other words, he's summing up. This is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> he's summing up what he spoke about from chapter 7. Remember chapter 7, we got into Melchizedek last week. We got into uh, uh, Melchizedek was a priest king. He's this uh, mysterious figure with no beginning, no end, no record of genealogy. So uh, the writer says Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek. He's not after the order of Levi, uh, the, Levi the Levitical priesthood. So he says, uh, so he's summing everything up. He says, we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. We have such a high priest who is seated at at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. This is a power-packed verse that uh, we should give attention to. There's four key words in this verse that the writer uses to describe Christ as a superior high priest. Four key words. The first word, such. We have such a high priest. Hebrews 7.26, he uses such. He says, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. What is such? What is, what is, why is that such an important word? Well, like the former high priest, Jesus was human. We know that he was flesh and that he could identify with their weaknesses. But unlike the former priest, he was holy. He was perfect. He didn't need to offer sacrifices for his own sins. He was the sacrifice. So that's the reason why he was such a great high priest was because of, because of who he, his perfection, his holiness. Basically, such is superior. <laughs> he is a superior 
priest because he was perfect. He was holy. It was so much greater and higher. The second word uh, that we see is the word seated. Such a high priest who is seated. Seated. We'll, we'll see that as in other verses. When we get to Hebrews 10, we'll see he's seated. Seated. Why do you... We've talked about this before. What do you think... Um, what do you think that means? Why do you think that's such an important word? He's seated. He's going to remain. There you go. I knew it. Yeah. Remember, the Bible says he ascended on high and he sat down. We'll get to that in, in chapter 10. He's seated. He, the work is completed. He's going to remain. The work is done. It's done. There's no, it's finished. The work is finished. There were no chairs in the Old Testament tabernacle in the temple because the priest was always on his feet, laboring, working, offering the sacrifices for the people. The work of the priest was never finished. He could never sit down. He had to keep offering sacrifices. The blood of animals didn't have the power to wash away the sins of the people, right? Couldn't wash away guilt. It couldn't wash away the shame. It only covered their sin until the day when Jesus finished the work on the cross. Jesus sat down. He's a superior priest. Number one, because he's holy. He's perfect. Number two, because he's seated. The work is done. The third word pertains to where he's seated. There you go. The right hand of the throne. The key word throne. Throne. The fact that he's seated on the throne adds to his superiority. He's seated on the throne in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Not only did the former high priest never sit down, but they never sat on a throne. <laughs> you couldn't be a priest and a king. That's why there was only one, this Melchizedek, who was a priest and a king. So Jesus is priest and king after the order of Melchizedek. So he's a superior priest, right? Because he's seated on the throne. The fourth word pertains to where the throne is. Where is the throne? In the heavens. In the heavens. In the heavens. He's seated as high priest in the heavens. He's as high, he's as high of a high priest as you could bet you could be. He's high. He's in the heavens, right? So he's the ultimate high priest. So he's a superior priest, verse 1. Superior priest because of those four words. He's seated. It's finished. He's on the throne. He's holy. He's perfect. He's high in the heavens. So which leads to point number two, a superior place. He's ministering in a superior place. Verse two says, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. The priests ministered in the earthly sanctuary of the temple, the tabernacle. That's where they ministered. Jesus is ministering in the true temple, the true sanctuary of heaven. So he uses, he, he speaks of the tabernacle. Of course, we could say tabernacle, we could say temple. They're both he, uh, held the sanctuary. But in those days, I mean, he's hitting home because... Uh, remember, this is before the destruction of Herod's temple in 70 AD. So to the Jew, the temple is the most holy place on earth. I mean, it is, it is where the presence of God is. Um, the temple was the central point of Jerusalem. Everything was built around the temple. When, uh, when you stand up on the Mount of Olives, you see the Golden Dome, but that's the temple area. If, you're st if you look at a picture, if you just Google up and look at a picture from the Mount of Olives into the old city, wherever you see that dome, just envision this massive orifice just covering, I mean, that's the central, the central point. So he's saying the earthly temple, or, or the, the priests minister in that earthly temple, but Jesus is ministering in a temple much greater than that earthly temple. I mean, he is, he's hitting it hard. This is hitting home because there was nothing more holy than this temple. 
But yet Jesus said, oh, yes, there is. It's the temple of heaven. The temple of heaven, heaven's temple is a superior temple. In the earthly temple, the priests offered gifts and sacrifices of animals. But in the heavenly temple, Jesus is the gift. Jesus is the sacrifice that was offered. So in essence, what made the heavenly temple so superior was because of the superior priest that occupied the temple, <laughs> right? That's what made the temple, the earthly, what made the earthly temple so great and grand was the inner sanctuary where God's presence would dwell in the smoke, but the smoke would come and his presence would dwell. But in heaven, Jesus is there. <laughs> so that's why it's a superior temple. Look at verse four. For if he were on earth, if Jesus were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest. And in other words, they wouldn't, he wouldn't be a priest because he's not of the tribe of Levi. <laughs> it's like he completely, he's completely above the, uh, the Levitical system, the, the old system. Since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Now that's an important phrase. The priests serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain, a copy and shadow. <coughs> Basically saying that everything that was done on earth under the law was just a copy and shadow of what was to come. Just a copy. It's just a shadow. The priests who offered sacrifices were copies of what was to come through Jesus. The priests weren't permanent. They were a type. They were a shadow, a forerunning of the ultimate of the high priest. The temple, the tabernacle, were only copies and shadows of what was to come. Does everybody understand that? It was, just, it was just like a model, a figure model. <laughs> when God gave Moses the pattern for the tabernacle, Moses had to follow the pattern. The pattern was given by God to Moses, and he had to follow this pattern because it was an earthly type of a heavenly, of a heavenly temple, right? And so he had to follow it to perfection. He had to follow, I mean, every cut had to be just right, had to have the, the, the right type of wood. It had to have the, everything had to be perfect because it was, a, it was a shadow of the heavenly tabernacle. And so the writer here is saying, as grand as that temple is, we know you're tempted to go back under that old system. We know it's beautiful, but, but, but just remember, there's a, there's a greater temple there's a superior temple. Why do you want to go back to that, just, a, just that type, that shadow, when you've got the earthly temple waiting for you? You've got heaven. You've got a heavenly temple that's waiting for you. And so, remember, he's making the case on what is there to go back to? What is there to turn back to? <laughs> we've got a superior high priest and we've got a, who, who serves in a superior place, a, a superior Temple, which leads to the third, the third point, verses six through thirteen. Superior promises. This new system comes with superior promises. Verse six says, "But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises." A mediator of a better covenant established on better promises, superior promises. A mediator is a go-between. A go-between is one who ensures that both sides fulfill their part of the agreement. Moses was the mediator of the first covenant. He was the go-between, right? God gave him the law. Moses presented it to man. The priest was... Uh, the high priest was a mediator under the law between God and the people. The people had to go through the priest to offer their sacrifices to God. But now Jesus is the mediator of this new covenant 
which, ha which has established better promises. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. One God, one mediator. The promises under the first covenant were conditional. They, the promises under the first covenant, you had to do this to obtain the promises. You had to do the law to obtain the promises. You receiving the promises were contingent upon you receiving the law. That's not, but, well, well, let's say it like this. The, the better promises that Christ has established are not based upon doing the law. They're unconditional. They're based upon receiving his sacrifice. That's the better promises. The better promises. So for the remainder of the chapter, he gives five promises. Five better promises. Verse 7, 7 through 9. says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second, because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. So under these uh, better promises, the first promise here is the promise based on grace. It's a grace promise. It's a grace promise. Like, like I mentioned, the, the promises under the law were conditional. They were contingent upon you doing the law. The promises now are based solely on the grace of God. Notice, notice he says, because finding fault with them. See, under the, under the first covenant, under the law, when the, peop, the people kept breaking the law, they kept breaking the covenant. So God found fault with them. Therefore, they couldn't receive all the promises because he found fault with them. But under the new covenant, all of these promises are based on God's grace whether we keep the law or not <laughs> whether we keep the law or not we obtain the promises because it's based solely on what Jesus Christ has done being a promise based on grace also means that the covenant is not just for the Jews anymore this new covenant is for everyone Gentiles all the nations of the world Everybody can be grafted in. Uh, Galatians speaks of, of the, the Gentiles being grafted in and obtaining this promise of Abraham. So it's a promise based on grace. Verse 10, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. So it's, it's a promise based on grace, but it's a promise of an interchange. I'll put their law in the mind and heart. An interchange. A change of heart and change of mind. The law of Moses could declare God's holy standard, but it could never provide, it could never provide a way to fulfill God's holy standard. It, it, it said, here's the standard, but it never gave you power to do the standard. <laughs> Because they couldn't produce interchange. The Ten Commandments can't change a heart. They only say, here's the commandments. This is what you've got to measure up to. This is God's standard. There's no, there's no power whatsoever in the law to change a heart. An external law can never change a person. The law showed us how unholy we are. The law could never make us holy. <laughs> how many, but, but isn't it amazing how so many people who go to church are involved in just different denominations. And I would say the majority of Christendom believes that the, the more the law they do, the more holy they become. I mean, denominations, just 
the, the better of a person you are, the more holy you become. Do this, get this. Do this, get the problem. Don't do this. So, that is, I mean, Hebrews is the antithesis of that. <laughs> it's the complete antithesis. Because the law can never make anyone holy. The, basically, the law, all the law can do is show us how unholy we are and show us how desperate we need Jesus. That was the purpose for the law. We need Jesus. We need a better priest. We need a better sacrifice with a better covenant. We need something to cleanse us from the inside out. The law can't cleanse us from the inside out. We need a heart change. We need a mind change. And only this new covenant that Jesus instituted could change us from the inside. Why? Because when we receive Jesus, we receive His Spirit. His Spirit is what, is what changes us and, and empowers us and indwells us to change our hearts. Jeremiah speaks of, I will write the, I will write the laws. That's what this is coming from, uh, this uh, verse 10. I bet somebody's Bible has the footnotes of where this is. It's Jeremiah. 31. I was going to say 31. 31 through 34. 31 through, okay. Yep. And the context of when Jeremiah wrote that, if you remember with our little study of kings, we're well, not our little, our huge study of kings. <laughs> we studied literally every king in history. Jeremiah prophesied that when Judah was about to bite the dust, <laughs> they were going down by the Babylonians. And actually, actually, they were already down. <laughs> they were hopeless. <clears throat> But Jeremiah says, you know what, there's a day that's coming when, when the law, and we'll write this on your hearts. And Jeremiah was prophesying of the day Jesus would come. Okay. Third promise. Third promise, verse 10. Oh, Okay. The end of verse 10, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Well, this is the promise of intimacy. The third superior promise is not just that, that God's going to change my heart, that, that this covenant is based upon grace, but God promises intimacy. I'll be their God. They shall be my people. The promise of intimacy. Through the new covenant, this means God will continually have a close relationship with his people. Wasn't like that under the old system, was it? He'll never cast us off. He'll never abandon us. We have continual access to the Father through prayer. We don't have to access God through a high priest, through a mediator. We have direct access to God through Jesus Christ. That's a powerful promise. Just think of the day and time we're living in. As bad as things are, we have something that the people of the Old Testament did not have. I mean, we've got ridiculous gas prices. <laughs> we've got wars all over the place. Well, they had wars all back then, too. Wars, nothing. That's nothing new. <laughs> but we have, we can go to the Lord in prayer. We can pray about all this. Pray. If this was if this was back in 1000 BC, we would we would go to the priest, <laughs> and the priest would have to do do all of that. But we can go straight. We have a close, intimate relationship with the Father. That's what makes all these troubling things gives you peace in the midst of the troubling things. We don't have to be freaked out about everything because we've got a close relationship with our heavenly Father. Verse 11. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none of his brothers saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me. I mean, he's just going to reveal himself to those, to those, uh, the people that have uh, trusted in, in his son. From the least of them to the greatest of them. He's, he's, um, he's not a respecter of persons. All can know me. All can know me. All can have an intimate relationship with me. Verse 12, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. I mean, these promises keep getting better. Perhaps this is... <laughs> 
This is the best promise, the forgiveness of all my sins. <laughs> Number four, the fourth promise is the promise of forgiveness of all sins. Forever forgiven. Forever eternally forgiven. Under the law, there wasn't forgiveness of sin under the law. The law did not provide forgiveness of sin because the law was not given to forgive sin. Old Testament sacrifices only brought a remembrance of sin, not remission of sins. Only Jesus' sacrifice could take away the sins of the world. All the Old Testament sacrifices did, they just atoned this. It just covered it up. Swept a little dirt over it. You know, co cover it up. Put a band they put a band-aid on your sin for another year. That's all they did. But Jesus, because of him being a superior high priest in a superior place and giving a superior promise, we have the forgiveness of sins through his sacrifice. Uh -huh. It says the Old Testament sacrifice brought back, brought a remembrance of sins, mm -hmm. not a remission. So you took that sacrifice in there, remembering the sin mm -hmm. that you brought that sacrifice for. Yep. Whereas the, the, the Lamb of God, the sacrifice, cleansed all those sins. They're gone. Yep. They're gone. Wow. That's powerful. I think it's interesting to notice that. The Ten Commandments are often posted in courthouses where people are judged. Mm -hmm. And basically it's saying you're guilty. Mm -hmm. Maybe these verses ought to be yeah. in the courthouse that they shall not teach every man his neighbor. Anyway, for all, I will be merciful right. to their unrighteousness yep. since they are unrighteous. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's, that, that's absolutely right. Of course, Paul. But the law did allow people who followed it to get to the point that when Jesus came and atoned their sins, then they do have the promises that we do. Yes. Yeah, but the problem is nobody could ever follow the law. Not one person has ever followed the law. Only Jesus. Only Jesus followed yes. the law. And I get that, but those people who were given those instructions that he tried to, they're not going to be suffering for eternity. Of course not. Okay, that, yeah. Of course, the, the, the whole point, the key is shadow and type. Yeah, I get that. That was the system that they had. Right. All of those who did that, they, they, they went with that sacrificial system. Of course, that was their redemption. But it still was not the superior. We're talking about the superior. Correct. This is the superior. This is by grace. That was the system that God put in place to, to redeem and rescue fallen people until Jesus would come. Yep. So yeah, if we live there, we just show up, we just go to Jerusalem every year, just keep going to Jerusalem, bring our sacrifices, keep doing it, and, and you know what, I'm going to do it. Because I want to go, year. but I want to go, I'm, I want to go to heaven, so I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. And God's going to see that. And God's going to see that, and he's going to accept that sacrifice. It sounds like to me a prophecy that God gave them these laws because maybe some of them didn't recognize what was. Yeah. The Apostle Paul said that, that the law was our schoolmaster. The law gave us instruction. I mean, I think the Ten Commandments, I think those things are good being posted because it gives structure to lawlessness. It gives thou shalt not, thou shalt not. I mean, it's good that you post speed limit signs. It's good that you have laws in place. It's good that you have this. It's good you have regulations for whatever and this and that and the other. We, we need these. But any law, just in general, any law does not have power to save us and change our heart. Seeing a 35-minute speed limit, a 35-mile speed limit sign isn't going to change my heart where I'm programmed to always go 35 you know, or 55. Or, usually when we see the speed limit signs, our premonition is to go above it. <laughs> if they change it to 70, we're going 75. If they change it to 75, we're going to 80. Then we're going to 85. And then we're going to... That's human nature. You're always going to press. You're always going to... You tell your kids, don't touch this. They're going to touch it. 
it's just, this is just how we're wired. The whole point of Hebrews is, thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus. Why do you want to go back to that, okay? Why do you want to go back to that when the greater, you have the greater right in your heart. You have the greater in your heart. The forgiveness, the eternal forgiveness of sins. He says, I will remember their sins no more. Does this mean that God has amnesia? And like he just lost his mind and he lost his memory? No. Uh, he hasn't forgotten what we've done, but this simply means he chooses to not hold the sins against us. I mean, it's not like he forgot. Oh, what, what? No, he chooses not to hold the sins against us. Jesus took, took that. Jesus took the wrath of God. All the sins that he, didn't, that he withheld from us or all the wrath that he withheld from us, he placed upon Jesus Christ. It sounds like when we study Hebrews that God is teaching the Jew, Jewish people, but we were grafted in later. Mm -hmm. he, set, he set the guidelines and told them about this heavenly priest, and then we became part of that. Yep, Absolutely. All of all of this, all of this points to Jesus. All of this is the type shadows of Jesus. even the all the pieces of the old tabernacle inside. It all points to it all points to Jesus. And yes, we're we're grafted into this. Absolutely, absolutely. So we have a superior forgiveness of sins, and then he says. In verse 13, in that he says a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. He's turning the page. <coughs> now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. New. A new covenant. He's made the first obsolete this word new, the Greek form, means new in quality. It's not like it's brand new. new in, it's not new in time, it's new in quality. So the new covenant is of such quality that it will never need to be replaced. It's always new. It's always new. It's always fresh. Therefore, it's eternal. It's an eternal covenant. It's an eternal blessing. And that's the fifth promise, the promise of an eternal blessing. It's forever new. It's forever eternal. So we have a superior priest, a superior place, the temple of heaven, the tabernacle of heaven, and superior promises. And, and, and basically, like we've seen through every other chapter, keeping in line with the purpose, with the thesis statement, the whole purpose of the book. Why do you want to go back to this old system when you've got the greater? When you've got the greater. Press on to maturity. Remember the danger of immaturity? Remember uh, 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 chapter 6? Press on. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. You've got everything that you need. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Be encouraged. Keep moving forward. So I want to ask you a question. So we know that the purpose of this book is to encourage those persecuted Christian Jews who want to turn, who want to go back. We know that's, that's, that's the purpose. As we studied the book so far, book of encouragement, right? It's a book of encouragement. Keep going forward. Keep going forward. Don't turn back. So what's your observation in the approach that he's taken to encourage the people to go forward? Like, what's your observation about everything he's saying? Like, the thing, it's all about encouragement. What are your thoughts about it? 
what, what are your thoughts? Like, what, what tactic is he using to encourage the people? I guess that's what it is. What tactic do you see that he's using to encourage the people? That's a sub point. There's just a big idea. What is his tactic that he's using? That's close. Uh -huh. What's the tactic he's using to encourage them to keep going forward? What's the book all about? Jesus is superior. <laughs> Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. You want to be encouraged? Look to Jesus. Magnify. All of that stuff comes. That's the fruit. That's the fruit of looking to Jesus. Jesus is greater. Jesus is superior. The reason I'm saying that is because isn't this so counter to so much of the preaching and teaching that we have today concerning encouragement? Like today, you know, you got, you, you know, you got the seeker-friendly preachers and teachers their encouragement is basically just producing narcissistic sermons about me, 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 I, 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 be encouraged, keep hoping, keep pressing forward, keep doing this, keep, keep hope alive, keep my positive attitude, and that's encouraging preaching today, right? The, the problem is none of that produces true encouragement. <laughs> If anything, you become, the more you look at yourself, the more condemned you become. The more, I, the more I'm told what I need to do, the more I realize I can't do it. I, the more discouraged. I mean, have a positive attitude. Just keep, have, have hope. Okay, have hope. Okay, hope in what? Have hope that things will change. See, that's what it is. Have hope things will change. Hope and change. Remember Obama? Hope and change. <laughs> I mean, that's not encouragement. Encouragement is instead of magnifying yourself and magnify Jesus, magnify Jesus. <laughs> yep, look to Jesus. He's our high priest. Look to his superiority. Look to his promises. Look to his sacrifice. When you get condemned, when you fail, when you mess up, when you trip up, don't look to yourself. Look to what he did for you. Look, look to, to, verse, to, to these verses in here of these promises. I will remember your sins no more. Look, look to that. Look to what Jesus has done. Look to his word. Yep. So I, I, just, I just thought of that today. Is it just every single chapter? It, it's a book of encouragement. But every single check, it's not a how-to manual, is it? We haven't seen any how-to. No how-to whatsoever. <laughs> no live your best life now. You know, this would not, this probably wouldn't be a New York Times bestseller because we like the live your best, we like all that. No, this is, look to Jesus. <laughs> look to Jesus. He's greater. He's better. He's superior. It's a better sacrifice. He paid it all. He, sit, he sat down. He's seated. It's finished. The work is done. Paid in full. What's that? That he's going to return. That he's going to return. That's right. I, mean, I, think, I think that's a hope and a promise that sometimes we see that empty tomb and remember, let's remember the empty tomb that he's no longer there, but we have to remember that he's coming back. He's coming back. And, there, and there's the true hope. Mm -hmm. And it's Jesus. It's nothing about material things. It's nothing about the money. It's about he's coming back for his church. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's how you deal with discouragement. Looking unto Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. We'll see that. Uh, Hebrews 12. Looking for the blessed hope and the glory appearing, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Any other thoughts and observations? That's rain. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say,
Isn't that the truth? Like it is. Yeah. Until it's embedded in them, it is. It's hard to let go. You can't. It's it's a stronghold almost. Yes. I mean, yeah, it's easier. Somebody who is like a drug addict, alcoholic, <laughs> that's that's just has no hope. Well, that part, they're looking, they're looking, man, they're, but one that's been indoctrinated, yeah, in church their whole entire life, that, um, My dad was one of those. He was raised tough. in the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah. Do's and don'ts, lots of do's and don'ts, be good, go to confession, you know, that sort of thing. And when I was able to lead him to Christ, the first thing that was out, out of his lips was, I can't be saved. I've done too many bad things. Wow, yeah. And yet he went to church all his life. Mm -hmm. Went to Catholic school, everything. Mm -hmm. so. well, yeah, you're, you're programmed, you got to do this. The more you do, the better you are, the more you, the more you get. But, yeah. but, but what happens when you get this? It doesn't, you, you don't go out and live a crazy life. When you really get grace, when you really get this, you got, you got the change on the inner, the promise of the interchange. I'll write your law on the heart and mind. You have a desire to want to do what's right. You have a desire to live a holy life. You have a desire to want to honor God and come to church. When you do mess up, you got the Holy Spirit. He convicts you. You repent. So, you know, the people that say, oh, you got, you got to keep, you got to preach law and grace. You got to keep the balance of law and grace. No, all grace. When you really get grace, you're going to want to do the law. <laughs> You're, want to, you're going to want to do it. That's why it's just, it's just this inward change. You know, and I've heard it and I've said it before. The more, when you, when you real, the more you realize what Jesus has done for you, that's when you want to do everything. When you realize he's done everything for you, that's when you want to do everything for him. That's when you want to serve him and, and just live your life for him. Because it, it's, a, it's a transformation from the inside out. And so we need more grace. We need more grace because grace, man, the, the grace of God, it, it gives you the hope. It gives you the encouragement to keep moving forward and keep standing strong. And that's Hebrews. That is Hebrews. It's exactly what the writer of Hebrews is saying. So if you have issues, just take it up with him. I'm just the messenger. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to close in prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll actually have some, um, some prayer requests. So, Lord, we just thank you for your grace. We thank you for Jesus, the superior priest in a superior place in the heavens, and we thank you that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. We thank you that he's the perfect sacrifice. He is holy. He's sinless. Jesus paid it all. Jesus did it all for me. And we thank you for these superior promises through our receiving Jesus Christ. Thank you that our sins are forgiven. Thank you, Father, for just the hope that we have, the promises through grace. We thank you for the eternal blessings, Father, in Jesus' name. And we just give you praise. And we just want to receive this into our life. We want to let it change our our hearts and change our minds because we want to we want to keep going forward we we don't want to turn back we don't want to quit we want to be faithful until you come father and we want to be uh, we want to be witnesses we want to be witnesses and tell others about this good news so we thank you for this powerful encouraging book of hebrews in jesus name amen amen thank you all for watching we'll see you on sunday